anyway. Uh, so we're going to finish up this series today on emotions. St. Augustine, fifth century theologian, said emotions are like smoke from a fire. And I love that illustration because that's exactly what emotions really are. Uh, you don't have fire. Uh, I mean, you don't have smoke unless you have fire. And so smoke tells us there's more going on underneath the surface than, than just the smoke itself. And that's what emotions are. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter if it's good emotions, bad emotions, but, but emotions reveal to us on the outside uh, what's going on on the inside uh, of, our, of our life. And we, we, looked, at, we uh, looked at doubt. We started off on Easter Sunday uh, looking at doubt. If you have a problem doubting your salvation, you have a problem doubting God, what God said in his word, there's something going on the inside. You got a problem with, with God. You got a problem with God's word. You, you, you got a problem with trusting your feelings more than your faith. And so we talked about that. And then we talked about cheer. Uh, we did a cheer up checkup. And uh, we talked about how, how cheer doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Jesus said in this word, you're going to have tribulation, be a good cheer, uh, because there's good cheer versus bad cheer. He said, I've come to become the world. Then last week, we talked about anger, and uh, the Bible doesn't tell us not to be angry. Uh, the Bible gives us two kinds of anger. Uh, it tells us there's righteous anger, uh, and it all depends on where your love is. It, it all depends, you know, do we love God? We love people, and, and of course, we're not to just sit and get run all over by the world. Uh, there are things we need to stand for. There's things we need to cry out over. There are things that ought to bother us. We ought to get angry because it has to do with the right kind of love. And then we talked about unrighteous anger. There's unrighteous anger is kind of uh, deep-seated in the love for ourselves. And when we get angry over things, we need to ask ourselves, what, what are we defending? And I get, what am I really defending? Am I defending righteousness or am I defending myself and my situation and, you know, my circumstances and my time, whatever it may be. Now, today, uh, we're going to look and we're going to finish up this series on the emotion that affects all of us, uh, the emotion that's like smoke from a fire. Uh, and that today, we're going to look at envy. We're going to look at envy. Envy affects all of us. And we're going to look how, we're going to look how, what God says about envy and how dangerous really envy can be. E envy, it's kind of like the check engine light on your car. Uh, you know, it, it's there, it comes on. Uh, then, you know, you realize, man, I can't ignore this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just got my check engine light. I've been on my car for about three months and I finally, you know, and I, I fixed it at first because I put some tape over it. And, uh, and then the tape came off and the check engine light was still on. So I figured I got to do something about this. Now, I, I said this a couple of months ago or maybe a year or so ago. A lot of times the check engine light comes on. It doesn't mean there's anything that's going to cost you anything. I found out sometimes it comes on because of the, the uh, gas cap. Gas cap ain't on right. Check engine light will come on. And, uh, and so I did that one time. Somebody told me that. Brent or somebody told me that. And I did my gas cap. And guess what? After a couple of days, check engine light went off. And I said, that is very cool didn't cost me a dime. This time, check engine light was on. I kept messing with the gas cap for three months and uh, it didn't go off. So I had to take it to the repair shop. Uh, they fixed it and it did cost me something, okay? And I'm just kind of curious. Anybody traveling around right now with your check engine on? Raise your hand. Come on, confession time. Okay, some of you. All right, okay. So Y'all like me, just, you know, it, the check engine light comes up. It says check engine. I pull off the side of the road, pop the hood. Yep, it's there. That's as far as I can go. All right. The engine's there. I don't know anything else to do. Well, envy's like that. Envy says it comes on. We have envy swelling up. We know there's something that's not right about it. And we know we need to take care of it. Uh, but we're afraid it may cost us something or what it's costing us, whatever. So envy uh, is like that. So we're going to look at a story today uh, from the uh, children of Israel of, of what envy really did in their life. So take your Bible, turn me please to the book of Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Now, you know the background. God delivers the children of Israel out of slavery or out of Egypt for over 400 years. They've been crying out to God. And God delivers them, you know, parts the Red Sea and all of that. Uh, then they're, 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 they're supposed to go into the promised land and God, and, and Moses sends out 12 spies and the 12 spies come back, you know, and, and, uh, 10 of them said, we can't do this. They're, they're giants in the land. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb said, we can't do this because God said we can do it. And they didn't do it. They voted. They were Baptists. They voted and uh, they were outvoted. And so they were disobedient to God. And so now they're wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. And so now we pick it up in numbers chapter 11. They're about one year in. They're about one year in, or a little over a year in from when God delivered them out 
of Egypt. And they've seen miraculous things happen uh, during, already. I mean, God's taking care of them. He's leading them by, you know, by cloud, by day, leading them by a pillar of fire by night. Uh, they're not starving. Uh, their clothes are not even wearing out. They're in the desert. It's just a miraculous. God, God is showing them, yes, even though you were disobedient to me, I'm taking care of you. I'm not leaving you. I've not dropped you by the wayside. But they fail to see it, okay? Uh, listen to verse 1, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. By the way, everybody look up here, man. I said last week, the number one sin that God probably judged more than any other sin, especially in the Old Testament that I can find, is the sin of complaining. Uh, there was a group of pe people that were complaining one time, and God opened up the earth and swallowed them whole in front of the presence of all the people, scared them to death, and I reckon so. Uh, 14,700 people one time were cursed by God and sent a plague because of their complaining. God sent some serpents one time, snakes, to bite people, and they died because of their complaining. Let's pick it up. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tabera, uh, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Now, the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to the intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? And we remember the fish, we were already ate in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now, I want to get this. Uh, 400, about 400, 450 years, they've been crying out to God in Egypt. They've been slaves. They've been slaves in Egypt. Slaves in every sense of the word. And they've been crying out to God. God, you don't care. You, you forgot about your people. You forgot about your promise. And God heard their cry. God heard their plea. And he raises up Moses. And you know all about the 10 plagues. You know about what it took. To, uh, to get Pharaoh to finally let the people go. And God did it in such a miraculous way. I don't know if you realize this, but the, the Egyptians took all their gold and all their silver and all that and gave it to the people. I mean, they, he, they just lavished them with all this gold and stuff and said, get out of here. And it's an amazing thing what God did, but they forgot about all that. I mean, here they are a little over a year out and they've already forgotten about what God uh, has done, how God miraculously delivered them. And they look back as they're in the, in the wilderness and they look back and they become envious of what the Egyptians have. They become envious of what they had back in Egypt, but they forget about the slavery part. Yeah, they looked at the food, they looked at the, you know, the watermelons and the cucumbers and the leeks and garlic and onions, which don't really sound, I mean, all that great to me. I mean, it just sounds like one big miraculous salad bar. But they got, they got looking at it and said, well, all we got is this manna. Now, but by the way, this is manna from heaven. I mean, this is, this is miraculous. Every morning they wake up, it's just miraculous. God is taking care of them. I'm pretty sure manna is not all that great after a while. I get that. But they're envious of what the Egyptians have and what they don't have, which, by the way, is the uh, definition of envy. You might want to put this down. This is a note-taking message. You might want to because you, because you may need it one day, and you're probably going through it. We all go through it. We all are guilty of envy. But what is envy? Well, the sim simplest definition of envy is wanting what you don't have or uh, the feeling that what you do have is not enough. Now, let me say it again. That's better than y'all thought it was. Envy is wanting what you don't have, looking at others and, you know, and, and, and you don't have what they have, or the feeling that what you do have is just not enough. And envy feeds off comparison. And this is where envy comes from, because we compare. We compare ourselves to others. And it's so easy to do uh, on social media. I mean, we are, we are hooked up on Instagram and, you know, Snapchat and Facebook and all of that. It's so easy because, because we, we all, we, you know, we all post these pictures. You know, I, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. And I got to tell you sometimes, man, I let you guys are doing awesome. I mean, you are doing absolutely awesome out there. You look awesome. Your husband looks awesome. Your wife looks awesome. Your kids look awesome. You're eating awesome food. You're taking pictures. Your food is so awesome. You're taking pictures of it. Look at my awesome food. You know, everything, everything's, just, everything's awesome. You're doing good. You're great. Your kids, your grandkids. Now, come on. We all know that you only post stuff that's awesome. 
You don't, you, you don't look like that all the time. Can I get an amen? I mean, come on, man. Some of you, you know, you've got curlers in your hair and guys need shaving. You stink. I mean, I, and you don't take a picture of that. You, 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 sometimes, come on, somebody say amen. Sometimes your kids just flat get on your nerves, right? And you don't take a picture of that. Here's my whiny kid. Aren't they awesome? They whine awesome. And sometimes you burn your food. And sometimes, come on, in Fayetteville, you don't always get great restaurant service in Fayetteville. Come on, you know that. But we don't, but, but see, here's what happens. We post all of these. And by the way, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't post that. I mean, you're having a great time. You're having a great time with your family. You're having a great time with your kids. I get that. Post it, you know. But here's the deal. Somebody posts that. And then you get, mm, something wills up in you. Say, man, well, I don't know about that. You know, somebody, somebody posts, they post a picture, you know, and we're at the beach, we're at the beach with a family. And if you're not careful, you go, well, how do they afford that? I know what they make. How do they afford it? I can't even afford a beach ball, let alone go to the beach. <laughs> and so what happens is, and then here's where, here's where envy really grows. And this is the danger. Uh, envy can grow where not only are you a little envious that they can do that and you can't right now, you be, you, you, envy can grow to where... Uh, you wish that wouldn't happen to them at all, that they could never go to the beach because you can't go to the beach, or that you're even happy when something happens to this awesome couple and their world falls apart and you're almost a little happy about it. Now, we can look all spiritual and we can say, well, no, never, never. But God knows, God knows how envy grows. And God knows what envy does in the life of all of us. And that's why envy is, uh, is so, so devastating uh, to the kingdom of God. Now, envy uh, is, is, is rooted in comparisons. And, and, and I read not long ago where comparisons fall into three major categories. And you might want to write these down. Three major categories. Number one is material comparison. And, we all, and, and that's kind of the, the easy one. You know, uh, somebody drives up in a new truck, brand new truck. And uh, you liked your old truck, but now they, have you, have you seen these new trucks lately? I mean, you know, we, you got these beautiful trucks yeah, and they're four wheel drive. You ain't going four wheel driving in that truck. I mean, you know, and you, and you look at your old truck and you liked your old truck until you saw the new truck. Now you want a new truck. And the same thing with a house. It's, it's material uh, comparison, you know. Uh, and then number two, there's relational comparison. Today's Mother's Day, and I get that. And, and, and be honest with you, on Mother's Day, I know there's mixed emotions in this room right now. Some people really look forward to Mother's Day. Some people really look forward, and you honor your mom, and moms are so happy on Mother's Day. And I, and I, hope, that, I hope that's true. I hope you treat your mom well. I hope you take her out to a really nice restaurant, you know, like McDonald's or someplace like that. <laughs> you know, Wendy's. Uh, but there's some moms in here that Mother's Day hurts. It, it hurts. My, my wife uh, loved Mother's Day until her mom died. And that just kind of hurts. And then there, there are some uh, sweet ladies in here today, and you can't have a child. You've tried to have children, and you don't have children. And you see all these moms, and, you know, and people are doing things, and you want to be a mom. And, and so uh, it's, it's easy uh, to be a little envious. It's easy to say, do they not know what they have? I want to be a mom so bad and they're moms and, and they just act like it's just, you know, anything. But, but the bottom line is it, it, there's mixed emotions here or worse. And here's the worst. You have children, but for some reason you think somebody else's children are better than your children. Somebody else's children has it all together, man. They make all the A's, you know, they, they got it all together. Your kids, man, they, you know, they, uh, they can't even hardly spell. And you wonder about that, and you, see, you get a little envious. You know, any, any envy can happen to anybody, anywhere. You know, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, man, I had an, my uncle. Guess what? My uncle died and left me $2 million. And instead of getting happy about that, you go to your prayer closet and say, God, kill my uncle and give me $2 million. Smote him, Lord. In the name, you know. As, envy's weird about that. I mean, envy distorts how you look at people and how you look at things. And God, God knows that. And then there's circumstantial comparison as well. And uh, circumstantial comparison 
uh, if you're not careful, it says, you know what? They have a better life than I have. And, and I don't know why God's got it in for me. I, I don't know why I'm sick all the time. And I don't know why our family struggles all the time. And I go to the same church they do. And, and I'm there as much as they are. And I read the same Bible they do. And I listen to the same messages they do. And yet we can't even make ends meet. Look at them. Their life. So much better than ours. And then it filters over into your relationship uh, with God. You know, somebody, uh, somebody has a better job uh, than I do. And I've got more education than they've got. And they got a better job. Now, listen, I want, I want to say a word about that. I know it is very, very easy uh, to, look at, to look at me and to say, you know what? That brother hasn't made. And uh, because he only has to work one day a week. See, that's, that's supposed to be funny. And you think that's true. Uh, and I get that. And by the way, can I tell you in so many ways, I do have it made and I understand that. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for the people there in Lake Baptist church that, that give and, and, and that you do and you serve to, you know, that, that I get to do what I do. I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade what I do for, for $10 billion. And I mean that with all my, I love, love you guys. And I love what I get to do here on Sunday mornings at the lake. And I mean that with all my heart, but there is a backstory to that, that you may not see. And that is while you guys are out on the weekends, while you guys are posting pictures, you know, of your family and your ball games and, and all the stuff that you're doing normally on the weekends, especially on Saturday afternoons to Saturday night, I'm in my study. I'm going over this message. This don't come to me like spiritual giants. I got a study for mine. And I'm in my study and I'm going over the message and I'm doing all that. And then I got to go to bed early. I go to bed early on Saturday night. Why? Because Sunday morning is rough. Sunday mornings can be tough and I want to be sharp and I want to be awake. And I don't, I hardly ever go out on Saturday night and I'll go to state dinner and I don't see all that. And all of you, all of you, you're posting, you're going to the ball game, you're going to the beach, you're doing all of that stuff. And, 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 and then what happens in my life, I get, to, I get a little bit on the weekends, I get a little bit of pity party. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, y'all at the ball game, y'all down at the beach. You go ahead, you heathens. I'm going to stay here with Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. Bunch of heathens going to the ball game. I'm just going to hang out with Jesus and lead people to Jesus. Now, I didn't say envy was rational, by the way. And by the way, that's on me. That's, that's my problem. That's, you know, but, but, but it's so easy to say, well, he's got a better job. And not, now, now. With relational uh, or circumstantial comparison, here's what here's the danger. The danger becomes, I like his wife better than I like my wife. I like her husband better than I like my husband. And so this is how envy grows. And so this is why God got angry. I mean, God struck him with fire and said, how dare you look back? How dare you look back at what I delivered you from? And you think they got it made. They're better off in Egypt than we are out here being delivered from slavery. And God's anger was kindled because of comparison, because of envy. And this is what comparison does. This is what envy does. Look at verse 6. Uh, Numbers 11 verse 6 but now listen to what they said L listen how this affected the children of Israel but now our whole being is dried up there's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes underline that in your mind or even with a pencil or whatever you can underline that little phrase there he said our being is dried up literal translation means our souls are dried up oh uh, you know what they're saying they said we've we've gotten to the point to where we can't even worship God like we should. We've gotten to the point that we think instead of praising God for delivering us out of 450 years of slavery, we got to the point where we think God's given us a bad deal. Where we've gotten a bum rap from God. Our souls are dried up. We're not praising God like we should. And by the way, this is not far removed from God parting the Red Sea. And the children of Israel walking through on dry ground. And then God closing up the sea to destroy their enemies behind them. This is not far removed. And you would think that's got to be an event that you ain't never going to forget. But they did. They did. 
And then to the point where it says, you know what? We got to eat this manna. We're out here in the desert. We wish we were back in slavery. And we're talking about slavery. We're talking about having your backs beaten. We're talking about families being separated. We're talking about when Pharaoh gave a, 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 an edict and he gave a command. He said, you know what? Tell those Hebrews to keep making bricks. But instead of our Egyptians delivering straw to them, they got to go out and get their own straw. And they cannot, they cannot uh, 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 limit the production of bricks. Now they got to make bricks and they got to go get their own straw. And they got to make the same amount of bricks as they made before. Labor, labor, hard labor out of the Egyptian sun. Backs being beaten. They were slaves in every sense of the word. But now, because of envy, because of their situation, they're looking back and they said, man, you know what? Uh, I wish we were slaves again. Listen to what Proverbs 14:30 says. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. That's what envy will do. It'll eat at you. It'll rotten your spirit. It'll rotten your very bones. Now, how does it do that? And why, how does envy do that? Well, we find it in this, in this story very quickly. Number one, envy forgets God's goodness from the past. Envy causes us to forget God's goodness from past. Am I talking to anybody here today? God's been good to you in the past. Somebody say a big amen. 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 God's been good to us. He's been good to me. He's been good to you. But envy, you start comparing, you start looking around. I don't have this. I don't have that. And she has this and he has that. And envy will cause you to forget God's goodness in the past. Listen, verse one, the people complained. Hebrews 11, one, that's how it starts out. The people complained. New, the New Living Testament says, soon the people began to complain about their hardness, about their hardships. Really? Their hardships? Just a little over a year ago, you were slaves, and now you're complaining because you don't have the right kind of food that you want to eat? You know, you see, this is what envy does. It, it skews your vision of how good God has been. And, and you get messed up because then you start focusing on what you don't have rather than what you do have. Number two, envy overlooks God's goodness in the present. Not only does it, does it affect how you look at God in the past, it, envy, envy, envy overlooks God's goodness in the present. Envy will cut off your joy. Uh, you see, you could be enjoying all kinds of good things. I mean, God should have been good. You've got so many things to be thankful for, but envy will keep your focus on what you're missing out on. As a matter of fact, it was a form of envy while we're in this mess in the first place. It was a form of envy while our spiritual, grand, our spiritual parents, Adam and Eve, how they messed up in the first place and how sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because of Adam and Eve's sin. And it was a form of envy because God said, look, look at all you can do. Look at all you can eat. Look at all you can have. You can have every tree around here except one. That's my tree. And you know what human nature does, right? Adam and Eve's going to says, hmm, I bet that's the best tree. I bet that's the sweetest fruit. We want that tree. Oh, yeah, I know God said we can have every tree around here. We can just eat it up. It's a, it's a buffet, but mm, that one tree, God's holding out on us. I bet that's the <laughs> best tree. And that's why we're in this mess in the first place, because of envy, envy. Uh, Tim Keller said this. And I like what he said. He said, envy will make you think something's wrong even when you're living in paradise. That's a good. He said, envy will make you think something's wrong even when you're living in paradise. Envy will rot your bones. Envy will cause you not to worship God for what he's done for you. Uh, over and then thirdly, the third thing, uh, envy ignores God's promises for the future. Not only does it envy affect what God's done for you in the past or what he's done for you in the present, but envy ignores God's promises for the future. Because let, let me remind you, God had already told them, this situation you're in, it's not permanent. This is temporary. I'm leading you. I'm leading you into the promised land. And over and over again, he gives a promised land in this beautiful description that maybe you and I can't really identify with. God said it's a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And we think, well, that's pretty good. Well, let me, let me put it in today's vernacular. God said the, the, the promised land is a land flowing uh, with Chick-fil-A milkshakes and Krispy Kreme donuts. Can I get an amen? Amen? Now that is promised land, man. Somebody say, praise God. You're not in Episcopal Church. Somebody say, amen. There you go. <laughs> over and over again, he said, listen, this promised land. It's promised to you as your land is a land flowing. Well, milk and honey, but they forgot about all that. They forgot that this is just temporary. Temporary. Listen, listen, and, and we all know, listen, how many of you know God has made us all kinds of promises that we don't see yet? But that don't make the promises any less real. That doesn't make the promises any less true. But God's made us all kinds of promises, and we don't see them yet, but they're coming. Listen to what Psalmist said. I love what David said, Psalm 1611. He said, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hey, listen, am I talking to anybody today? Jesus is coming to your heart. Am I talking to anybody today that Jesus promised that he's forgiven all of your sin? Am I talking to anybody today Jesus has written your name in the Lamb's book of life and he has no eraser? Am I talking to anybody today that has heaven as their home and you know it and your name is safe and secure and you're a joint heir with Christ? Am I talking to anybody today that's coming and you realize that it's coming? Forget about being in. There ain't nothing your neighbors have. There ain't no, nobody in this church has that is going to affect you. I'm telling you, it's all going to pass away and we've got glory forever and somebody say amen give God a hand clap of praise amen that's right your next door neighbor get that truck that truck's gonna burn up by the way can I remind you your next door neighbor got one of them $75,000 F Ford F-150 four door big screen TVs whatever the moment that rascal drove it off the parking lot it ain't worth two cents it's used. Love this story. What time is it? Okay. I love this story uh, about an old missionary and his wife. And they had given their life to Africa to serve Jesus. Their health was failing them. They had to come back to the States. So they were on a ship. They were below deck. Unknown to them on that same ship was Teddy Roosevelt, the president of the United States. Teddy Roosevelt had been in Africa for a month to hunt big game. And when they got close to New York and they got close to the, to the pier there in the docks of New York, they heard a band playing. And the old missionary stood on his tiptoes and looked out a porthole and he saw all these signs and thousands of people and signs saying, welcome home. Welcome home. And he thought, man, they're welcome us home from serving Jesus in Africa. But those banners and that band and those welcome home signs were not for him. They were for Teddy Roosevelt that had been over Africa for a month shooting big game. And boy, that bothered him. And he told his wife, he said, it's not fair. We served God in Africa all these years. There's nobody to welcome us home. There's no bands playing for us. There's nobody to greet us. It's just not fair. Teddy Roosevelt goes to Africa for one month. We've been over there for 40 years. And all these people, just, he's, all he did was just shoot some animals. His sweet wife said, you know, honey, I, I don't understand all, but I just don't think your attitude's right. I think you just need to really pray about it. So she left the room and he got on his bed there in that little room on that ship and he cried out to God and said, God, it's not fair. We give our life to you in Africa for 40 years. Been faithful to you. Teddy Roosevelt goes to Africa and shoots a rhinoceros. And he's come back as a hero. It's just not fair. There's so many people to welcome him home and there's nobody to welcome us home. And then the Holy Spirit of God just kind of flooded him. Only the way the Holy Spirit can do when you cry out to God sometimes. And the Holy Spirit said, my child, listen, you're not home yet. 
Amen. Amen. You're not home yet. Hey, folks. Yeah. Your next door neighbor, he got the truck. Your next door neighbor's kids, they got the scholarships. Yeah, all of these things happen. And it looks like those of us that try to serve Jesus and those of us that are here all the time and, and, and bless your heart and you're faithful and you give and it just seems like you take two steps forward and five steps backwards and you don't understand it and you say, I don't get it. The world cusses Jesus. The world has nothing to do with Jesus and they keep getting blessed. Let me remind you, that's all they're going to get. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a child of God, bless God. We're not home yet. You don't have anything to be envious of, man. We've got something that the angels are envious of. We have salvation and all God's people said. Two women, two moms. We're in a small group. And they were sharing uh, in their home group. And they started confessing some things. And the one mom looked at the other mom and she said, I got to tell you, I hate the pictures that you put on Facebook. You are the perfect Pinterest mom doing crafts with your kids, spending time with your kids. And she said, and, and I, I work for outside the home. I can't do that like I want to. It makes me so jealous and envious. I hate it. The other mom looked at her and she said, well, I got to tell you, I hate the fact that you have a life outside of the home. I hate the fact that you get dressed up. And that you get to dress up and that you get to be around some adults. She said, you know what? I haven't had an adult conversation since 2016. And I hated the fact when you post pictures of some of the conferences that you'd go to and some of those things. And they both looked at each other and they began to weep. They said, who in the world do we think we are? God's been so good to both of us. So I leave you with this. With all the emotions we feel, up and down, in and out, off and on, ladies and gentlemen, listen. Ask yourself, as I ask, I ask this to myself at 6.30 this morning, 6.30 this morning, in my quiet time, at my desk, at my office, at my house, I ask myself this question that I want to ask you. Folks, listen. When... Will Jesus be enough? When will the fact that I'm saved, when will the fact that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, when will the fact that all of my sin, past, present, and even future sin is all forgiven, that Jesus is my Savior and that I'm his child, that heaven awaits for me and fellowship awaits for me that I cannot even explain, that sorrow, no more sorrow, no more death, no more dying, no more separation. All of that one day is coming to an end. When will that be enough for me? And when will it be enough for you? We have Jesus. I don't think we need anything else. And all God's people say.